Wednesday evening. This is May the 28th. This is lecture 27. This is part one of the ninth commandment. Again, the ninth commandment is found in Exodus 20, in verse number 16, which reads as follows, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I actually had somebody say to me one time, the ninth commandment doesn't forbid lying. It just forbids bearing false witness in a court. But yet, the scriptures plainly tell us that we are to lie not and to speak truth every man with his brother and with his neighbor. And bearing false witness is, in fact, lying. And if we lie about anything, we're bearing false witness. This says against thy neighbor. So there must be some specifics. So let's delve into this a little bit so that we can get a better understanding of the ninth commandment. The eighth commandment, of course, concerned our own and our neighbor's wealth, estate, and goods. Thou shalt not steal. The ninth commandment concerns our own neighbor's good name. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. This is a caring, loving for my neighbor, which is the second greatest command, of course. Now, in our courts, it is expected that men shall tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, we're, we hear them say. They are tribunals for the execution of justice. And for justice to be executed, there has to be truth. Justice is based on truth, and any false testimony born in violation of truth and produces a miscarriage of justice is the bearing of false witness. For this reason, therefore, perjury is made a criminal offense, and rightfully so, because through perjury and other forms of crime, uh, people may go unpunished, and other crimes may go unpunished and the innocent could be made to suffer in this aspect. The most bare and unblushing form of this sin is, of course, that of slander, the lie invented and distributed with malicious intention. Probably no form of injury done by man to man is more despicable than this, when we slander someone's name with the intent, with a malicious intent to injure them. If we rob a man of material things, they soon may be replaced if not recovered. But the slanderer who invents a lie forms a weapon that takes away a reputation and the chances of that being regained are nearly nothing. This oftentimes causes untold prolonged suffering to the innocent, while in so many cases the liar goes undiscovered and unpunished, often protected as a particular witness to a crime that may never have happened. As with the previous commandments, so it is here, much more is implied than is specifically stated. We have, uh, as we have so often pointed out in the course of these lectures, each of the Ten Commandments enunciates a general principle. And not only are all other sins forbidden, which are allied to the ones named and prohibited, together with all the causes and tendencies thereto, but the opposite virtue then is required and everything that promotes it. Thus, in its wider meaning, this ninth commandment reprehends any word one would speak which would injure the reputation of our neighbor, be it uttered in public or in private. In the widest application of this commandment, then, it has to do with the regulation of our speech, which is one of the distinguished and ennobling faculties that God has bestowed upon mankind. This commandment is given to control our tongue in speech so that we don't injure another one created in the image of God. We talk too much. Most people do. I know there's people that hardly ever talk. They're probably what ought to be the norm for us because most of us run our mouths too much and we always have an opinion about another man. And we need to be careful with that opinion because it could border slander. It might have malicious intent in our heart if we're not careful. So here's some things that Scripture tells us about the tongue so that we can get a general introduction to this. First of all, the tongue has the power of death and life. And that's Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. 
we got to be careful because the things we can say can actually kill a man physically, or if he doesn't kill them physically, it can destroy their reputation to the point that they can no longer be successful or to carry on their business. I've heard of people being accused of all sorts of malicious crimes, and it ruined their opportunities to get jobs, possibly even landing them in jail. We know a man one time that attended our congregation that was maliciously lied against and spent some time in jail. And the truth is, when, when it was finally uncovered, do you know what the general consensus was? I wonder if he really was telling the truth. I wonder if he really did lie. I wonder if this really did happen. Even though he was vindicated, even though they found out this is not true, didn't matter. In the back of everybody's mind, they were wondering. That's how dangerous the power of the tongue is. Secondly, there's a lying tongue. When you're just somebody that lies. In Psalm 109, verse number 2, For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. Notice these people. They're the wicked and the deceitful. Wicked and deceitful have opened their mouths against David and they used a lying tongue to do it. So this is how you get somebody. If you don't physically have something to get somebody, you'll lie. What happened to our Lord and Savior? Did Judas tell the truth? Did the witnesses that came against Jesus in his trial tell the truth? In Proverbs 6, 17, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. So these are the things that God hates, a lying tongue. Proverbs 12, 19, the lip of truth shall be established forever, but the lying tongue is but for a moment. Boy, isn't that amazing? Something that is just but for a moment can cause so much damage. Proverbs 21, 6, the getting of treasures by a lying tongue is vanity tossed to and fro of them that seek death. And Proverbs 26, 28, a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. A flattering mouth worketh ruin. How sad. Somebody can lie and afflict people, but even a flattering tongue, because you know flattering can be lying. If you're bragging about somebody that's doing something or accomplishing something in a way that they really haven't done it, oh, you're the most amazing. You are incredible. Oh, you can do anything. Oh, you're just so beautiful, puffing up their pride and damaging them, especially if the things we're telling them simply are not true. So not only does the tongue have the power of life and death, but the tongue there is a lying tongue, and then thirdly, there is a deceitful tongue, one that operates under the radar. Psalm 120 and verse number 2, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and... From a deceitful tongue. So we can have a tongue that likes to exercise duplicity. We have a tongue that doesn't like to tell everything exactly as it is when it comes to telling the truth. And we it uses deceit. David's asking to be delivered from that. Then fourthly, there's a flattering tongue. We already talked a little bit about that. And the verse that I'm using here comes from that text in Proverbs chapter number 6 where the young man is tricked by an adulterous woman. He says to keep thee from the evil woman and the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Strange woman being a woman that she's not your wife. She is strange to you in that aspect. And so with that in mind it leads us to a better tongue which is a wholesome tongue. A wholesome tongue the Bible tells us is a tree of life. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach of the Spirit, Proverbs 15, 4. Boy, when you've got a tongue that is telling, that is actually focused on the health of an individual, and that's the idea of something being wholesome. It's like when our body, if we have a broken leg, our body's not considered whole, but if we, we are restored to health, we are now whole. And a wholesome tongue is one that's interested in the goodwill of another person. It's like the tree of life. Sixthly, the tongue of the just is like choice silver. Proverbs 10, 20. The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. So when you've got a just man, his tongue is like the silver coins that are worth so much. Um, but the heart of the wicked isn't worth anything. Number seven, a froward tongue shall be cut off, which is, that's encouraging. Um, Proverbs 10 and verse 31, The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the froward tongue shall be cut out. A tongue 
that is forward is a tongue uh, that would lie and a tongue that would go forth with, with just foolish and vain ramblings. The tongue of the wise is health. We read earlier Proverbs 12, 18. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. Those are painful words, aren't they? Like when, you, when somebody says something, it's like a sword just jamming in you and twisting and hurting. And he says then, but the tongue of the wise, or excuse me, but the mouth of, excuse me, where am I at? Oh, oh, there's a tongue, there is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Again, we're back to that idea of a wholesomeness. Number nine, the wise use their tongue for knowledge that is right. Proverbs 15 and verse two, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So we want our tongue to be used in a wise way. We want to take the knowledge that we have and use it correctly. Did you know that you can have knowledge and not use it rightly? Right. There can be times that we could actually injure someone and hurt somebody by simply telling what we know. Now, if you know something that doesn't need to be told because maybe you're not the cause nor the solution to the problem that's there, Maybe because you only have a little bit of information, you have a little knowledge, you have limited knowledge, and you want to tell something, we're tempted oftentimes to speculate. Well, now all I know is this, but let me tell you what I think that means. Uh-oh, you have just gone into some dangerous territory. You're about to slander someone if you're not careful. And so the wise will use their tongue and their knowledge rightly. We're not going to tell it unless we have to tell it or it becomes critical uh, in some nature, maybe to preserve a life or something of this nature. Number 10, a liar gives ear to a naughty tongue. So a person that likes to hear naughty things usually has a lying tongue. Listen to what Proverbs 17, 4 says. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips. So you've got somebody that's a wicked, that does wicked things, they're paying attention to false lips. And a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. Liars love to get new knowledge. Gossips love to get new information. Number 11. One with a perverse tongue will get into mischief. Proverbs 17, 20. He that hath a froward heart findeth no good, and he that hath a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. And it's so easy. Your tongue, if it's perverse, if it's twisted, if it's not what it ought to be, it's going to end up causing you to get into all sorts of trouble. Number 12, those who keep their tongue keep their soul from troubles. Proverbs 21, 23, whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. If you would like to have less troubles in this world, say less, speak less, control your mouth, control your tongue, keep it. The word keep here is the same thing as an idea of guarding or setting a watch upon something, to keep something. In fact, castles used to have rooms called keeps, and a keep was a safe room that could be locked. You could put someone in the keep, and they couldn't get out, or no one could get to them. So a keep was a place of safety and security. Knowing that, listen to that verse again. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth, his soul from troubles. You're locking it up. I used to tell my children a cute little way to remember this, that the tongue, the Bible says in the book of James, and we're going to see that verse in a little while, is, is set on fire of hell. It's like an untamed beast. And I said, so what do you do with untamed beasts? What would you do with them? And my children would look off. You shoot them. I said, well, if you're not going to kill them, what would you do with them to keep them from hurting anybody? Put them in a cage. Exactly. The tongue is like that wild beast. The thing to do is put it in a cage behind those teeth so that it can't flap and wag. If you do this, you're less likely to say things that you shouldn't say. Just keep your tongue in that cage because we are so tempted to want to wag our tongues, talk about, say things that we know nothing or little about. So whoso keepeth his mouth, 
locks it up in the keep, and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. It's like your soul gets put in the keep so that it doesn't get injured. Number 13, a soft tongue wears a person down. Proverbs 25, 15. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded. Yeah. And a soft tongue breaketh the bone. So, we know what, what these gentle words and continual encouragings can do. It can go for good and it can go for evil. An angry countenance drives away a backbiting tongue. Proverbs 25, 23. Listen to this and think about it. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. So, when the north wind comes, big cloud in the sky, and the north wind comes and it blows, and that cloud goes away and the rain leaves, goes away somewhere else. He says, well, guess what else is like that? It says... An angry countenance. So, have you ever had your parent look at you when you were a child and go, give you the evil eye? And you know what that means. Stop what you're doing right now. Well, one of the best ways to shut up somebody who's slandering or somebody who's gossiping or somebody who's saying things they ought not say is give them a look. Like, are you sure you want to tell me this? Are you sure you want to continue with this line of conversation? Give an angry countenance. I don't like that. And they will immediately stop and say, Wow, what's the matter? I don't know if you want to go there. I don't know if you want to say those things that you're thinking or that you're about to say. You don't know what I'm about to say. But if you're about to say something that's going to make me angry, don't say it. A lot of times, just a look is all it takes. Proverbs 26 and verse number 20 says, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out, and so there is no tailbearer. Where there is no tailbearer, the strife ceaseth. Again, he uses a, an example they would understand. You've got a fire burning in your fireplace, and you run out of firewood. What's going to happen to the fire? It goes out. So, he tells us in the, in the same way that when, once you get rid of the tailbearer, the person that's always got something to tell. Oh, did you hear about Miss So-and-so? Oh, did you hear the latest on Preacher So-and-so? The tail bearer, always got something going, always got something stirred up. It says, you get rid of the tail bearer, strife ceases. If nobody has something juicy to tell, then there's no strife going on. Very important lesson for us to who we listen to and, and, and the things that we say. Number 15. A person that rebukes sin will find more favor than a person that actually has a flattering tongue. People tell me all the time, you know, I just want to be told the truth. I think they'd be better off if they were told the truth. But I think a lot of times we just want to be flattered. But we're told in the Bible it's better to have the truth than a flattering tongue. Proverbs 28, 23. He that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. There it is. You rebuke somebody, afterwards they're going to say, thank you for coming and telling me those hard words. I've had many people say to me, you said things to me that I didn't want to hear. I didn't appreciate it. I didn't like it. And I've also had people that if you, if you try to give them a compliment, they wonder if you're telling the truth. So it's better to, if, if somebody really is in sin, don't flatter them, rebuke them. Number 16, the tongue can set on fire the course of nature and the fire of hell. Wow. This is where we come to James. James chapter 3, verse number 5. In fact, the entire chapter of James chapter number 3 deals with the tongue, which will be a good read, but we're going to read several of the verses right here. Verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member. Tiny member of our body, isn't it? I mean, compare the size of the tongue to my hand. And, and even my head itself. The tongue's a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Yeah, only takes a match to start a forest fire, doesn't it? it only takes a little word to get somebody stirred up. You know, I've had people tell you, well, don't you say another word, don't say another word, and you go, word, just to aggravate them. Verse six says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So the tongue 
So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Jesus tells us where all that comes from. It emanates from the heart, doesn't it? This literally sets on fire the course of nature. If you want to get an, an angry man angrier, keep talking. If you want to make a sad person more sad, keep talking. You can just provoke a nature and set it on fire that way. An untamed tongue is full of deadly poison. That's what verse 7 of James 3 says. For every kind of beast and birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. That's why I use that verse to say, put your tongue in a cage to my children. Because all kinds of beasts have been tamed, but the tongue can no man tame. Now, there are those, number 18, that love life and will not let their tongue speak evil. And I think that's a good goal for all of us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days. You know, stay out of trouble, you love a peaceful life, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips if they speak no God. That will give you the greatest peace of all. If you just make sure that you do not engage in slander and gossip and lies and bearing false witness, you're gonna make your you're gonna make your life peaceable and you're going to see good days. Control that tongue. You'll be amazed at how good it'll be. Uh, have you ever heard somebody tell a child, that mouth of yours is going to get you in trouble? Well, it's a very accurate. You will not love life or see good days if you do not keep control of your tongue. Now, our words are not to be uttered lightly, or thoughtlessly for that matter. The Bible tells us that a person is justified or they're condemned by the use of their words in the book of Matthew, chapter number 12. Listen to what it says, Matthew 12 and verse number 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now don't you think how many idle words we do speak, words that don't really help, they don't edify, they don't strengthen, they're just, they're just useless, empty words. For by thy words thou shalt be justified. And by thy words, I shall be condemned. Haven't you ever been in a situation where somebody said, Now, what did you say? Did you say such and such? And you're like, Well, yeah. Okay. Well, that was completely inaccurate. Or maybe they've said, Did you say such and such? You said, No, I never said that. Well, that's what we were told you said. So make sure that when you do speak, you speak clearly, concisely, and you say exactly what you mean to say so that no one can interpret your words to mean anything but what they are, and that's the truth. We need to pray that God would set a watch over our mouth and our tongue. In Psalm 141, in verse number 3, the psalmist says, Set a watch, O Lord, like a guard, post a guard before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. There's that word keep again. Watch it. Keep guard on it. Make sure that nothing can happen. Just set a watch, Lord. When you get up in the morning, maybe if you're struggling with things that you say and you shouldn't say things, you say things you wish you hadn't said. Maybe if you have a tendency, man, I'm always saying something I wish you hadn't said. Pray this prayer. Say, Lord, set a watch, O oh Lord, before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lips. If it'll keep you from getting in trouble, I think it would be a very important thing to do. So, on Friday, we're going to pick up with our duties concerning our tongues, our speech, and see how they're all summed up in a single verse. So thank you for watching this evening.